Last Sunday afternoon, I was travelling south through the, the Holy Land when the local guide who was with us pointed out that we were close to a place that for over 20, 2,500 years has been famous as the site of a great injustice. Naboth owned a vineyard near Jezreel. He refused to sell it to King Ahab, who wanted it. And in response, Jezebel, the notorious wife of the monarch, had Naboth falsely accused, then executed, so that her husband could take the land for his own use. Well, as part of our visit to Angola, we went to a part of Luanda called the White Sands Estate. It has a beautiful name that hides a dreadful reality. It's a place where thousands of families who've had their land elsewhere in the city confiscated, taken from them, live crammed together in impossibly squalid surroundings. It's somewhere you can't do justice to in, in, in pictures or statistics. You actually have to smell it to believe it. It is appalling. The people there told us with great dignity of how, where they used to live before, the police had come along and hemmed them in, uh, I think for several days, and then forcibly evicted them and demolished their homes. We watched young children in White Sands foraging on a rubbish dump only metres away from the nearest dwellings. Like Naboth, they had fallen foul of wealthy individuals who wanted to take what little they had to enhance their own prosperity. Legally, they should be entitled to compensation, a bit like your compulsory purchase orders in this country. If they get good advocacy support and are prepared to wait for several years, some of them might be lucky enough to get rehoused. But if they are rehoused, it'll probably be somewhere that's far from the city centre where all the jobs are. Well, nothing in the UK bears comparison with what we saw in Angola, but when we visited the Petrus Project in Rochdale, we came face to face with people in our own city region were pushed to the margins of society, people who don't have safe and secure homes to live in. And over 20 years, probably 25 years now, since I was first involved with Church Action on Poverty, um, involved in helping set up the church response to homelessness that is now housing justice, I come up with a short checklist of the basic needs that have to be met before human beings can be said to have a place to live and belong things that are denied, certainly in White Sands, but also here in Greater Manchester for some people too. So here's a quick version of that list that you may wish to reflect on in your groups. Firstly, if we're to have a place to live and belong, our basic human needs have to be met where we live and belong. We have to have protection against arbitrary eviction, such as the White Sands people had experienced. There need to be robust tenancy and other laws that are actually upheld. We need to have a safe and healthy environment, free from infestation and from damp. The smell of white sands on its own was enough to show that wasn't the case there. We need to be able to control the access of others to the places where we live and belong. We need to be able to lock up possessions safely away when we're not there to keep an eye on them. And to have a place to live and belong means that that place has to be available to us 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Not some kind of bed and breakfast accommodation that we're kicked out of in the morning and allowed back into later on in the day. We need space to prepare and eat our food, space to wash, to relax, to sleep. And it has to be affordable. If it isn't affordable, it, it isn't real. We need to be able to pay the rents, the rates, the fuel costs for where we're living. The choice that many people seem forced to make at the moment, eat or heat, is a very um, apposite one. So we need to have those basic human needs met where we want to live and belong. 
But we're not just isolated individuals, we're part of community, part of society. And so there are other things that the places where we live and belong have to have in order to enable true belonging to take place. We need to be in a community where we can access a range of services, education services, leisure. There needs to be somewhere we can go and work, places where we can shop, practice our faith, obtain finance, have access to transport. In another part of Angola, we met another group of people who had been evicted from where they had lived and moved out so far from the city that the commuting costs of $80 a week, $80 a month, were more than half of the average working class wage of $130 a month. People were spending more than half of their monthly income simply on commuting into work and back. To belong, we need to be part of a safe environment outside of the home. That's about levels of crime, about the perception of the risk of crime as well, and those two are not always the same thing, about sewerage and rubbish disposal. How do we make our environment outside of our home safe? To live and belong, we need to live within reach of our personal support networks. One of the things that has enraged me in this country in recent times over welfare changes, and particularly the bedroom tax is a good example, is a way in which people are often forced to move away from where they have informal, free support from friends and neighbours and family, maybe to move far away where nobody knows them, where they either have to do without that support, whether it's child minding or whatever it may be, or just help getting the shopping in, to places where either they do without the support or somebody has to pay for it to be delivered to them. That doesn't seem to make sense. We need to be able to live where we can reach our personal support networks. We need to have somewhere where we can live and be the host and receive guests. I was working with a project in Birmingham some years ago with refugee groups. And when we managed to provide them with some premises, and we opened those premises on the first day, very movingly one refugee said, until today I have always been the guest, today I am the host and you are my guests. It was an incredibly moving speech. We need, if we're to live and belong, to have somewhere where we can be the host and others can be our guests. And we need opportunity to participate in and contribute to the life and governance of the neighbourhoods where we live. And through that to contribute to the governance of wider society. We need to be able to volunteer, to take part in elections, to have places where we can meet free of fear that what we're doing is being observed by agents of the state or the police or whoever it may be. And again at White Sands we felt even among the representatives of the community we felt probably some of these were perhaps paid spies, people with connections to government, people who were not really there for the benefit of those people but maybe there because they were keeping watch. So the reasons may vary between Angola and Manchester, but in both places there are human beings who are denied a place where they can live and where they can belong, denied those basic human needs and denied those more communal needs. And why are they denied it? They're denied it because their interests are overruled by the interests of the powerful, just as Naboth found all those centuries ago, and as my Palestinian guide reminded me earlier this week. Thank you.